Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is John Gallo. I'm the CEO and Executive Director of Legal Aid Chicago. Welcome to our third installment of our series, Legal Aid Matters. Today's session will cover the LGBTQ rights, in particular for students. So now to get started, I want to introduce my colleagues, Nina Terabessi and Joey Carrillo. Nina and Joey. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the third presentation of the Legal Aid Matters series. Uh, Joey and I are going to be talking today about legal protections for LGBTQ students. Um, this is the first day of Pride Month, and we're very excited to be able to highlight uh, some of the work that Legal Aid Chicago does for LGBTQ clients throughout the city. For those of you who aren't as familiar with our organization, within the Children and Families Practice Group, Legal Aid Chicago has an education law team that works on all education issues for youth in the care of DCFS, so the Department of Children and Family Services, including special education, school discipline, residency, and sexual harassment. And we're also able to provide support to low income families in those last two areas. So school discipline issues and students who have experienced some form of sex based harassment or sexual assault. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in addition to our education law team, the Children and Families Practice Group is home to the LGBTQ Anti Violence and Safety Project. Um, this is my fellowship, uh, Equal Justice Works Fellowship Project. Um, the LGBTQ Anti-Violence and Safety Project focuses on bringing the work of our children and families practice group to the LGBTQ community uh, here in the Chicagoland area. For many in the community, access to justice is exacerbated by a fear of further mistreatment and discrimination by lawyers, judges, court personnel, and law enforcement. And um, uh, last, the LGBTQ Anti-Violence and Safety Project focuses on bringing culturally responsive legal services to uh, LGBTQ survivors of domestic violence, assault, harassment, and stalking in substantive areas of domestic violence and sexual assault protective order litigation, divorce, and child custody, in addition to the few other to the areas of education law that Nina mentioned earlier. So just kind of taking a look at what we're gonna to cover today, we're gonna to start off with some basic terms. So what do we mean when we say LGBTQ? What percentage of young people actually identify as LGBTQ? Um, and what the current school climate is really like for LGBTQ students? Um, we're also going to introduce a client hypothetical that we'll use throughout this presentation, just to give you a more tangible sense of the type of work that we do and how these issues impact our clients. Um, so that's the first section. The next section is going to look at names, pronouns, and school records. So what should a school be doing when a student identifies as transgender or gender nonconforming and is using a name or pronouns that don't match their birth certificate? After that, we'll take a look at bullying and harassment with a focus on Title IX and the Illinois Human Rights Act. Um, next, we'll look at access to bathrooms and sports teams, again, under Title IX and the IHRA. And then we'll wrap up with a conversation about advocacy, how to actually enforce students' rights. So there are a lot of different topics that we're going to cover today. And as John mentioned, we will stick around at the end of the presentation for questions. So as Nina mentioned, before we get into some of the substantive areas um, of our presentation today, we wanted to give you a very quick overview of uh, some basic terms and concepts. Some of you might be familiar with these terms already. We wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page as they'll come up time and time again throughout uh, different points of the presentation. So most people are familiar with the LGBTQ acronym and that it stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer and questioning. Uh, but we wanted to highlight the framework that encompasses these terms and the community as a whole. So starting at the top uh, with the first term sex, often people conflate sex and gender as being one and the same because many people's experiences of gender aligns with their anatomical sex. Anatomical sex is often referred to as sex assigned at birth and refers to the physical makeup of our bodies, including chromosomes, genital and reproductive organs, and body hair. 
Gender identity, however, has nothing to do with anatomy, um, but rather gender identity instead refers to our psychological sense of self, a person's deeply felt inherent sense of being that may or may not align with their sex assigned at birth. Gender expression, uh, also a different term, uh, refers to the way that we express ourselves in our actions, our physical appearance, our clothing, and our demeanor. Again, gender expression is a completely external um, uh, part of ourselves. And then lastly, sexual orientation refers to who we are, who we are attracted to, who we love. So we additionally wanted to uh, take some time to talk about um, a subgroup within the LGBTQ community that's rapidly growing in size. So there are approximately 1.9 million uh, youth in the United States that identify as LGBTQ. Um, within that 1.9 million, around 200,000 of those young people identify as transgender, which is an umbrella term referring to people whose gender identity and expression do not match the sex that they were assigned at birth. This is in contrast to cisgender people whose gender identity is consistent with their biological sex. Around 25% of LGBTQ youth identify as non-binary, gender non-conforming, or gender fluid. These are all terms that fall under the category of gender expansive youth. This just means that the way they experience and express gender does not clearly conform to being either male or female. Some gender expansive people view themselves outside of the male female binary completely, while others express themselves as feminine or masculine, depending on the situation. Because most of the population identifies as cisgender, transgender and gender expansive folks are often misunderstood stigmatized and targeted. Before we jump into some of our other topic areas, we additionally wanted to uh, highlight what is happening at the national level for the LGBTQ community. In the first six months of 2022, state legislatures have introduced 238 bills seeking to limit transgender students' access to sports teams, limit the ability of transgender youth to access gender-affirming health care, and prevent educators from even talking about LGBTQ issues in the classroom. Some advocates are labeling this as the worst year in history for LGBTQ legislative attacks. This has created a hostile environment in schools across the country for LGBTQ students. It's important to understand that for many LGBTQ youth, coming out signifies the beginning of harassment, stigmatization, and systemic discrimination. This is particularly true for LGBTQ youth of color, youth living with disabilities, and those growing up in impoverished areas. Anti-LGBTQ legislation further marginalizes LGBTQ students in our education system. Moreover, when school administrators do not follow some of the laws that we're going to talk about today, it can have a significant consequence for students including lowering their academic achievements and uh, resulting in overrepresentation in the juvenile justice system. So the last slide before we kind of get to our substantive topics is an introduction to our client, Sean. Um, because most of our clients are minors and many of them are youth in care, we were concerned about confidentiality. So Sean is kind of an amalgamation of a couple of different clients we've worked with. Um, we just thought it might be helpful to have a case study that we can reference back to throughout the presentation. So Sean is 14 years old, so he's a freshman in high school. He moved to an, a new district uh, at the start of the year, so he doesn't really know anyone. Um, Sean was assigned female at birth, and he recently started identifying as transgender. He uses male pronouns, he goes by the name Sean, his physical presentation is masculine. Um, Sean has a history of depression and anxiety and has in the past engaged in self-harming behaviors when he's been put in stressful situations. 
So Joey and I will come back to Sean and his experiences as we introduce new concepts. And we're going to start with names, pronouns, and school records. Um, at the beginning of each section, we have just some numbers to give you uh, an idea of the prevalence of these issues. So these data are from the GLSEN 2019 National School Climate Survey. 59.1% of LGBTQ students who were surveyed reported personally experiencing discriminatory policies or practices at school. And 22.8% reported not being able to use their chosen name or pronoun. Why does this matter? One of the most important steps in creating a safe classroom environment for LGBTQ students is ensuring that their gender identity and gender presentation are accepted and respected. And on a basic level, that means using a student's correct names uh, and pronoun. Um, I think that really comes down to the interactions that, that teachers have with students and the interactions that students have with each other. Um, but a lot of it is also linked to school records how a student is identified in the system. What name or pronoun uh, does the teacher or does a substitute teacher actually have on the class roster? Uh, the two main laws to be aware of when it comes to school records are FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and ISRA, the Illinois School Student Records Act. Uh, FERPA is a federal law that addresses access to and, and confidentiality of educational records and information, and ISRA is a state law uh, that kind of fills in some of the gaps. So as Nina stated, um, both FERPA and ISRA prescribe standards for schools to follow in handling student records. Uh, FERPA is the guiding legislation for what educational institutions can and can't do with student information. Uh, under FERPA and ISRA, students have a right to inspect all of their records that a school maintains, and students are additionally allowed to challenge the accuracy of each of these records. Parents must consent before schools can release a student's records to agencies outside designated educational categories and schools that don't follow prescribed standards under FERPA risk losing federal funds administered by the Department of Education. Protected student data under FERPA includes things like transcripts, discipline records, assessment results, course enrollment information, staff, uh, staff and faculty notes, um, both digital and handwritten, and fin uh, financial information, as well, and most expansively, emails or messages pertaining to the particular student in question. Under FERPA and ISRA, a student's non-educational information is private, and it provides students and their parents with both choice and ownership over their information. Under FERPA, students control who sees their records and when and they may request these records again at any time under both laws. So the Illinois State Board of Education, uh, otherwise known as ISBE, um, has released some non-regulatory guidance on how to support LGBTQ students in the use of their affirmed names and pronouns in school records. So according to um, ISBE, students have a right to be addressed at school by their affirmed name and pronouns and to update their school records to reflect their identity, including their affirmed name and pronoun. Schools should not place cumbersome or undue barriers that discourage, prolong, or prohibit the process of ensuring a student's record accurately reflects their affirmed name and gender identity. This means that schools should not require a legal name change or a change of gender marker on a birth certificate in order to update school records. Uh, you know, moreover, school districts should only include a student's gender marker on their school records where it's required to do so by law. And if there is a law that particularly uh, requires gender markers to be in school records, ISBE advises for schools to update those records in those situations. Lastly, schools are not required to seek parental consent to support transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming students, especially when the safety of a student is a concern. 
This is a particularly um, controversial issue that comes up in the school setting quite often. But a really easy example to understand this policy is thinking about how a school would not typically seek per parent or guardian permission to use a child's nickname at school. Um, that affirmative permission isn't required or necessary to use a student's affirm name in the same way. So returning back to Sean's case that we talked about uh, a little bit earlier, uh, despite guidance from the Illinois State Board of Education, many school districts don't adequately reflect students' names in school records. And this creates issues for trans and non-binary clients like Sean. Despite Sean's identity as a trans male student, none of his school records were updated to reflect this. In fact, the school district's policy required that all of Sean's school records had to match the name and gender marker on his birth certificate, despite the Illinois State Board of Education's comprehensive direct guidance against this. Being a new student in his school, none of Sean's teachers knew who he was or what his affirmed name or pronouns were on the first day of school. And so Sean was dead named in front of his classmates in several different classes. Now, just a side note, dead naming is what um, happens when a person refuses to acknowledge a trans person's affirmed name by calling them by their former, otherwise known as their dead name. So Sean, already a shy and vulnerable trans student, struggling to adjust to being the new kid in his freshman class at this high school, was experiencing repetitive dead naming by school staff and other and teachers, which caused Sean extreme mental distress and embarrassment on top of his already existing anxiety, um, being both the new kid and the trans kid at his school. So moving now to talking about bullying and harassment. Um, again, we've got some numbers from the Glisten 2019 National School Climate Survey. 81% of LGBTQ students reported being verbally harassed based on their sexual orientation, gender expression, or gender identity. Around 34% reported actually being physically harassed. And about 56% indicated that they never reported this harassment to school staff. Uh, I think that last number might be surprising, but the study also noted that of students who did make a report, about 60% said that staff took no action whatsoever, and around 20% were told that they needed to change their own behavior, um, as in, you are responsible for this, you should just not dress that way or just act that way. Um, a hostile school environment can have a significant impact on a student's academic success and mental health. LGBTQ students who are being harassed are more likely to miss classes, uh, have a lower GPA, are nearly twice as likely to have been disciplined at school, and have a much lower sense of self-esteem and sense of school belonging. So, how, how, how do we prevent this? What laws are in place to address these issues? Um, the Illinois School Code does have a provision that addresses bullying and harassment. Um, it requires districts to create and implement policies regarding bullying prevention, which includes procedures for reporting bullying and also procedures for initiating a school-based investigation. Uh, the definition of bullying in the school code is very broad. It does include cyberbullying, which is a form of harassment that we've seen a significant increase in in recent years. But in practice, the school code doesn't really provide any specific set of protections for students. So it requires some form of investigation, but it really puts no parameters on what that investigation actually has to look like. Uh, it doesn't require any supports for the student who's experienced the harassment either during the investigation or after the investigation. Um, there really is no clear right to specific remedies or resolution. So the bullying provisions of the Illinois School Code are important, but it's also important to understand their limited impact, which is why we typically turn to Title IX, which I'm going to talk about next, and to the Illinois Human Rights Act. So Title IX is a federal law. 
It's part of the Education Amendments of 1972, so it's actually celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. The language of Title IX itself is very brief. It, it says, here's the language right here, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. The, the underlying assumption of Title IX is really that access to education is a fundamental civil right and that discrimination or harassment can serve as a barrier to access. I think a lot of people might already be familiar with Title IX in the context of athletics. So originally it was focused on ensuring that student athletes had access to the same opportunities. And I think in recent years, we've also seen Title IX used to enforce protections for students in the context of campus sexual assault, predominantly in college and university settings. But as you can see from this language, Title IX is very broad. Uh, it doesn't just apply to college and university settings, it applies to all education programs receiving federal funding. Uh, it doesn't just address access to athletic programs, there's no language about sports here. It prohibits any form of exclusion or denial or discrimination on the basis of sex. Uh, in recent years, the courts and the Department of Education have clarified that the definition of sex includes sexual orientation and gender identity. So what does this mean for LGBTQ students who are experiencing sexual harassment? What are education programs actually required to do? Um, on, on a very basic level, a school has to have a Title IX coordinator who understands Title IX, understands the school's obligations under Title IX, and is responsible for managing the school's response. A school also has to have a non-discrimination policy, making it very clear that harassment on the basis of sex is prohibited. And that policy has to be accessible to students, to parents, to guardians. Um, and then finally, a school has to have created grievance procedures. So these also need to be accessible. And these procedures spell out how a school or a school district will respond when it receives a report of sex-based harassment. So at a minimum, must have that Title IX coordinator, must have a non-discrimination policy, and must have grievance procedures. Supportive measures. So this is one limitation that I noted when I was talking about the bullying preventions, or excuse me, the bullying provisions of the Illinois School Code. Um, when a student is experiencing harassment, often they need additional support uh, from the school in order to continue accessing their education. Um, LGBTQ students who are being harassed at school are entitled to receive these supportive measures under Title IX. Uh, there isn't any one list of, of supports that a student has to be given, but some common supportive measures that we've put on this slide are excusing absences. So if a student has had to stay home to avoid the harassment or has not been going to a specific class, uh, allowing them the opportunity to make up missed work, implementing a schedule change, a no contact directive, or putting in place a safety plan, um, and then connecting the student who is experiencing the harassment to counseling or to the school social worker. Uh, again, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, a school uh, really can and, and should be implementing any supportive measures that would be appropriate. But there is an obligation under Title IX for a school to be offering this support. Investigations. So as I mentioned, schools should be offering supportive measures to students in every circumstance. The Title IX coordinator should also be asking the student if they want to move forward with a formal investigation. Uh, and that process, what the investigation looks like, what the timelines are, what the standard of evidence is that will be used, should be outlined in those grievance procedures that I mentioned earlier. Um, students should be allowed to present witnesses, in K through 12 settings, there likely would not be a formal hearing, but there would be some form of cross-examination questions that would be written. Uh, and both parties have an opportunity to appeal.
There are a lot of details in this process that we're just not going to touch on today because we don't have time. But the takeaway is that Title IX provides a very clear set of protections for LGBTQ students who are experiencing harassment, uh, both from their peers and also from school staff. So in addition to federal Title IX protections from sex-based discrimination, uh, LGBTQ students are also protected from identity-related harassment in schools under the Illinois Human Rights Act. In 2006, the Illinois Human Rights Act was amended to include actual or perceived sexual orientation and gender-related identity. Uh, Illinois was one of the first states to codify protections for trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming individuals to be free from discrimination when it amended its statute in 2006. Under the Illinois Human Rights Act, a school has the responsibility not only to prevent harassment, but also to take corrective action once it has or should have knowledge that that harassment is occurring. If a school fails to take that corrective action, they may be in violation of the Illinois Human Rights Act as well. While the Illinois Human Rights Act has less procedural compliance requirements than those that Nina mentioned under Title IX, uh, the Illinois Department of Human Rights recommends that schools have a procedure to report harassment as well as a process for inter intervening uh, and taking corrective action. So taking a detour back to Sean's case, if you remember, Sean was dead named and misgendered by school staff and teachers on multiple occasions right after the beginning of school. After his classmates were alerted to the fact that Sean no longer went by his female dead name nor female pronouns, he also got bullied by his classmates every day. During the first month of school, Sean experienced, again, dead naming by teachers and bullying by his classmates. He was called a lot of different identity-based slurs. He was told things like, you should stay the way that God made you. After reporting this bullying, and identity-based harassment to his principal and school social worker, Sean was told that the bullying would be addressed. And, but at the same time, he was never connected to the Title IX coordinator and he was given no supportive measures at that time. Instead, weeks went by and Sean continued to be dead named and bullied. As a coping mechanism, Sean resorted to journaling on his school issued laptop where he wrote out his feelings towards his bullies. Unfortunately, one of his journal entries was perceived as a threat and he was suspended from school. When he returned to school, the bullying continued. Sean became so overwhelmed that he engaged in self-harm and was hospitalized. Had the school implemented supportive measures and actually addressed the harassment, Sean's exclusion from school and subsequent hospitalization could likely have been prevented. So we're going to pause right now um, for attendees who are looking to get uh, CLE credit. Um, the, the code is 679YTW. Uh, again, that's 679YTW. And I believe that the link um, to access the, the, um, the form to type in the code should be in the chat. So moving on um, to access to bathrooms and sports teams. Uh, once again, from the GLSEN 2019 National School Climate Survey, we know that 28.4% of LGBTQ students reported not being able to access bathrooms consistent with their gender identity. And around 27% reported not being able to use locker rooms that were consistent with their gender identity. Uh, as, as Joey mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, access to bathrooms, access to sports teams for transgender students, these have become very prominent issues in the past few years uh, on a national level. So there are federal protections under Title IX. Um, if you go back to that language that we looked at earlier, this does represent exclusion, denial, discrimination on the basis of sex, on the basis of a student's gender identity. So this means that schools should not be preventing students who, for example, identify as male um, from using the facilities designated for male identified students. 
uh, they also can't provide separate treatment. So they can't tell a student, you have to use a single stall gender neutral bathroom. Um, they can't require the use of privacy curtains in changing rooms to separate transgender students from their peers. Can a transgender student or the parent or guardian of a transgender student request separate treatment? Absolutely, but a school cannot mandate it. That would be a violation of Title IX. Restricting access and use of bathrooms or locker rooms to a student's sex assigned at birth is also a violation of the Illinois Human Rights Act. Uh, students must be permitted to access restrooms or locker rooms that align with their gender identity. Uh, Precedent uh, in the Department of um, Human or so the Department of Human Rights uh, has strong language interpreting the Illinois Human Rights Act, and this precedent uh, enforces the idea that students have to be allowed to access these facilities without having to provide further documentation or their proof of their gender. Additionally, the Department of Human Rights advises that discomfort or privacy concerns of other students, teachers, or parents are not valid reasons to deny or limit the full and equal use of facilities based on a student's gender-related identity. Looking now to uh, under both Title IX and the IHRA, LGBTQ students should have access to the same activities as their peers, and education programs cannot have policies denying transgender students access to a sports team consistent with their gender identity. Uh, in Illinois, there is a process if students are participating on a competitive level. So the Illinois Elementary School Association, IESA, and the Illinois High School Association, IHSA, both essentially require an application for a transgender student who wants to participate. Uh, but the point is schools are not the gatekeepers. Uh, and if a student is wanting to participate on a competitive level, the school should be assisting the student in submitting that application. So coming back to Sean's case, uh, at the beginning of the school year, Sean was told that it was the district's policy that students use bathrooms and locker rooms that match their biological sex. This meant that Sean had to use the girls' bathroom despite the fact they identified and presented as male. And at one point, Sean was even disciplined for attempting to use the bathroom designated for male identified students. Now let's think about gym class for a student like Sean. Uh, the school, his school district required him to change in a private single stall bathroom instead of the locker rooms used by all of the other students. As a result, Sean was once again singled out and he experienced more bullying and embarrassment. Other students would tease him through the door, throw things at the door while he was changing to scare him. The simple act of changing for gym class became another reminder of how Sean's identity made him different from the other students at his school. So we've spent some time talking about some of these laws that protect students from discrimination. And now we're gonna take some time to talk about what remedies are available to students when their rights have been violated. So we're gonna start first um, under state law under the Illinois Human Rights Act. Um, and under the IHRA, a parent of a minor child or that child, the student themselves, who believe that they've experienced discrimination harassment or retaliation may file a charge of discrimination with the Illinois Department of Human Rights. Um, and that has to be done within 300 days of the initial incident. Once that charge has been uh, received, the department then assigns an investigator to conduct an initial investigation, which includes interviewing witnesses and requesting production of documents in order to uh, conduct a fact-finding conference. If the department concludes that substantial evidence exists to support the charge, the student may request that the department prepare and file a complaint on their behalf in uh, the State of Illinois Human Rights Commission, which is the second administrative body that helps to enforce uh, the Illinois Human Rights Act. Um, so again, 
at that point, once there's been a finding of substantial evidence for the charge that was filed, student has two options. They can ask the department to uh, submit a complaint to that commission on their behalf, or they can seek uh, remedies in court, in the appropriate circuit court, um, in order to uh, get the remedies that they're seeking. So um, if they do proceed with the uh, Illinois Human Rights Commission, uh, an administrative law judge will be assigned to conduct a hearing. That administrative law judge will then have the authority to issue a recommended order and decision, which can order a school to do things like file a compliance report, um, to post notices of laws that they failed to post. Um, and additionally, an administrative law judge can also order actual or even emotional damages um, and, and, and other damages including, or other, other costs, including attorney's fees and court costs. Looking now to Title IX, there are two primary ways to file a formal complaint when a school district or an education program is in violation. So the first is to file an administrative complaint with the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, often referred to as OCR, which is responsible for enforcing Title IX. Um, if OCR conducts an investigation and determines that a program is not in compliance, it will first try and work with the program to establish compliance. But if the program refuses, the Department of Education can pull the school's federal funding. Um, an OCR investigation can take years, so this is not a, a particularly quick remedy, uh, but often it can lead to some pretty important systemic change. So that's one avenue. The other is to file a private lawsuit. Um, as with an OCR complaint, a private lawsuit can take a significant amount of time, but a judge could award monetary damages, injunctive relief, declaratory relief. Um, there often are more options for relief if you go into court. So you typically can't get uh, substantial monetary damages through an OCR complaint, but there are obviously uh, you know, pros and cons to formal litigation. So those are the primary enforcement mechanisms when it comes to Title IX. Um, there is a lot of overlap between Title IX and the IHRA, but there are some distinct rights under both. So which avenue makes the most sense in terms of enforcing a student's rights really comes down to the goals of the student and the specific circumstances. So finally, coming back to Sean, um, we've, we've taken you through his, uh, very unfortunate experiences with the school district. So their use of his legal name instead of his preferred name and pronouns, um, the harassment that he experienced from both staff and peers, and the embarrassment and further harassment that he experienced as a result of being forced to use uh, the locker room and bathroom for female identified students. Um, when Legal Aid Chicago took the case, our first goal was to make sure that Sean was not further disciplined for behavior related to the harassment that he was experiencing. So Joey mentioned uh, the message that he wrote on his laptop to his bullies. By the time we got involved, the district had recommended expulsion, which would have effectively excluded Sean from school for up to two years. Uh, because we felt that the harassment and discrimination was likely to continue if Sean stayed, uh, we negotiated with the district to have Sean transferred to the regional safe school instead of moving forward with expulsion. And we worked with staff at the new school to ensure that they were using Sean's preferred name and pronouns and that he had access to appropriate facilities from day one. Uh, we were also able to work with school staff to put in place appropriate mental health support. So Sean is doing really well there. He's, uh, he's just finishing up his freshman year. Um, but we still had a problem because although what was best for Sean in this situation was to move schools, that didn't really address the harm that he experienced and the fact that the district had clearly created a hostile environment for all LGBTQ students. So we sent a Title IX complaint to the Office for Civil Rights outlining Sean's uh, experiences with the district and the numerous Title IX violations that occurred. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, I noted that um, that Sean is a combination of a few different clients. The complaint that we filed is based on a very similar set of facts. So OCR has opened 
an investigation into the district. And it is our hope that the outcome of the investigation will lead to some district-wide changes that will ultimately benefit all students. So just one final note, um, as we look at all of the ways that this particular school district in Sean's case mistreated him because of his gender identity, we can see a recurring theme that many advocates in all practice groups at Legal Aid Chicago see time and time again. Rights don't present themselves. However, they have to be asserted and advocated for. Despite the federal and state protections that we talked about today, Sean still experienced discrimination and harassment at a time where LGBTQ students are experiencing increased stigmatization the work that we're doing at Legal Aid Chicago to make sure that students can continue to have access to their education is absolutely critical. Thank you. Thank you, Nina and Joey. Uh, after that motivating presentation, we'd like to share a number of ways that you can help. Uh, there are many ways you can support our mission of equal justice for all. We also welcome you to make a tax deductible donation to directly fund uh, our essential work. Um, as most of you know, our luncheon is just two weeks away, but there's still time for your firm or company to sponsor the event. Uh, finally, we have volunteer opportunities for attorneys and non-attorneys, as well as our ambassadors board. Uh, you can learn more about all these opportunities uh, on our website, which is LegalAidChicago.org. It's, I'm proud to say, a very user-friendly website, so you'll have no problem finding those uh, sources of information. That concludes the planned content portion of today's presentation. Uh, in a moment, we'll start the Q&A portion. Uh, before we do, a quick reminder, use the link in, a chat, in the chat to obtain CLE credit and to give a course evaluation uh, please join us next week for our session discussing our work with clients burdened with consumer debt scams. Uh, the panelists are going to remain here to answer your questions, which you should type into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And we already have questions that have come in. And so I'm going to turn it over to Kate Shank, our deputy director, uh, to field those questions and then to uh, uh, pose them to Joey and Nina. Thank you, John. And thank you so much, Nina and Joey, for what a terrific presentation. We've got some really great questions here. So I'm going to toss them out at you. So if you could start by sharing a little bit more about Title IX services and any advice or recommendations you have about how to best inform students of their rights under Title IX. So as I kind of briefly touched on, um, when I was going over those, those basic requirements, every education program, and this is kind of focused on K through 12 settings, but this is true in college and university settings as well. Every education program that is receiving funding um, from the federal government needs to have uh, the non-discrimination policy, the grievance procedures, and the Title IX coordinator. Um, and theoretically, all of this information should be very accessible. So if you go to a school district's website, there should be a section talking about Title IX, students' rights under Title IX, who the Title IX coordinator is, and how to get in touch with them. Um, and I think that that's probably the first place to go um, because that'll give you an idea. Every school district has slightly different policies or slightly different language. Every school district's investigation might look a little bit different. And so going there is going to give you a good idea of um, kind of if you were to move forward with some type of formal investigation, what that investigation would look like. And I mentioned that a student who's experiencing harassment is entitled to receive um, supportive measures uh, in any situation. Um, they don't have to go through a formal investigation to get a schedule change or to have a safety plan put in place. Um, so finding out who the Title IX coordinator is and finding out what those grievance procedures look like will help that student make an informed decision about how they want to kind of proceed with the process. In terms of, I think, making sure that everybody knows about these rights, I, theoretically, that's something that's supposed to come from the school district. Uh, and I know that Chicago Public Schools, uh, as a, a big example of this, uh, theoretically does hold training for certainly for staff members, but also for students and uh, for parents and guardians every year. Um, but I think 
there there certainly are a lot of people who are just unaware of of these protections and i don't i don't have a good answer for how to address that other than trainings like this that's a great answer thank you nina um could either of you talk about if you if you're aware of any situations where teachers or administrators have faced disciplinary action for dead naming a student or what other what what consequences if any um teachers or administrators have faced for that i can say in regard to uh sean's case um there, I mean, there were no immediate disciplinary actions for any of the staff members involved, although now that an investigation has been launched, that is that can be a time in which a school can address those kinds of concerns, because these investigations tend to put sort of public pressure sometimes uh, for schools to act. Um, Nina, I don't know if you've ever had any cases or experiences with this. Yeah. I, not specifically when it comes to dead naming, but I agree with you that the OCR process um, can result in uh, either disciplinary outcomes for staff members or um, an, an apology to the student. Um, we, we've had other OCR complaints, uh, complaints that have gone to mediation and staff members who um, behaved you know, very poorly, who didn't follow district policy, um, were involved in that process and, and issued formal um, apologies to the students, which I think um, might seem trivial, but I, for the student who has experienced um, harassment or, or has had you know, a, a really traumatizing interaction with the school staff member, I think that that can go a long way. I would also add to that like uh, staff training um, that is, again, it's, it's non-punitive, but like, uh, a remedy that that we ask for that we that we actually have uh, in the in past cases of like getting staff members trained on how to appropriately um, you know address students deal with those students who are uh, gender expansive or trans um, those types of trainings can be something that could be negotiated as a part of that process uh, that could address some more systemic changes where you have multiple teachers or multiple staff members who are not treating the community appropriately. Thanks to you both. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the OCR complaint? So what your um, it was enforced and just give a little bit more detail about that. I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I don't know when when that process um, was initiated. I know this is not recent. OCR has been, you know, OCR isn't just responsible for enforcing Title IX. They're also responsible for enforcing uh, a number of other federal civil rights laws that apply um, in education settings. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure when the the, the complaint process started, um, but just to give you a little bit more information that we didn't necessarily touch on in the slides for an OCR complaint, um, you have to make a report within 180 days, um, unless the the discrimination or the harassment that the student is experiencing is ongoing, in which case you have a little bit more flexibility. Um, you don't need to be an attorney to make a complaint. Anyone can can file with OCR, um, and there's an explanation of that process and, and the forms that you would need to file on their website. Um, it obviously can help to have an attorney who's who's familiar with the process and is familiar with putting together a, you know, a detailed legal complaint, um, but theoretically anyone could, could file with them. Um, and as Joey mentioned, essentially, um, OCR will take a look at the complaint, they'll make sure that they have jurisdiction, they'll make sure that, that the, the rights um, that have been violated uh, fall under one of the laws that OCR is, is responsible for enforcing, um, and then they'll determine whether it makes sense to open an investigation. Uh, and in Sean's case, OCR determined that clearly this fell under Title IX, clearly uh, there were numerous violations that were alleged, and so they determined that it was appropriate to open the investigation. I don't anticipate having a response from OCR about Sean's case um, for a while because there's a lot of information that they need to collect. They often interview staff members, they interview the complainant and, and adults who are involved in the process. Um, so again, it's, it's kind of a time consuming process, but our hope is that in investigating the district, the outcome won't be 
um, just something that addresses Sean's situation, but that the outcome will be really taking a look at the district's policies and procedures that allowed this kind of treatment to happen. Thanks, Nina. Could, could either of you talk about if you've seen any situations where parents have abandoned their LGBTQ children after they disclose their gender identity? I mean, yes, yes, I, I, I have seen that, unfortunately. Um, my, my last position was, was working for a, a community program um, and many of our um, LGBT youth were experiencing homelessness or housing instability because of uh, their family of origin. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if there was a, a question about what types of supports are out there for those students um, or, or what Legal Aid Chicago does. We, we often um, work, as I mentioned at the beginning, with youth in care. Um, so they're no longer unaccompanied minors, they're youth in the care of, of DCFS. Um, but certainly that does that does happen. And it's it's a very unfortunate situation. I will add to that, Nina, um, the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, I've recently met with them and they have a pretty uh, comprehensive program that actually goes out to um, different areas in the community to make legal services accessible to youth that are experiencing homelessness. Um, as you mentioned, you know, LGBTQ youth do end up experiencing homelessness at a disproportionate rate than other uh, member, uh, you know, other young folks um, that are non-LGBTQ. And so homelessness is a particular issue, um, especially after students come out um, and disclose either their gender identity, sexual orientation to non-supportive family members. Um, and they're, the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless does, you know, a good job of um, trying to provide some of that legal support and additional social services and support uh, for um, the LGBTQ community um, and those experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Could you give any advice um, or any recommendations for how schools should handle requests for um, a variety of pronouns? So, um, you know, there's the she, him, um, and then also they, there. What about other alternatives, ZZIM, et cetera? Um, how should schools navigate those requests or have you, have you seen that come up and can you give any um, commentary on, on how, they've, how they've handled it either well or not well? So I know the Illinois State Board of Education, um, I, I would definitely recommend that resource. You can go on their website and I'm also happy to share it. Um, their non-regulatory guidance on how schools should be you know, handling pronouns and names, whether it's in school records. They also have like additional uh, support in, in how schools can be supporting LGBTQ students and supporting them beyond, in like honoring that identity beyond school records. So that's a great resource that I would always uh, share with folks. Um, but if, if, in terms of other pronouns, I would, again, uh, one of the things that is incredibly important to the community is self-determination. And I've been, you know, working with a lot of gender expansive and trans uh, organizations that support um, the community um, dealing with issues of self-determination, name changes. And so, you know, I think that, that that for the community is incredibly important and it starts from a young age. And so the same guidance that we have about honoring pronouns, regardless of what those pronouns are, whether they're he or she or they or uh, Z or Zim, I think these are all pronouns that, you know, we should be treating in the same way in terms of like, honoring that student's identity, honoring their pronouns, and it's an opportunity for training uh, for staff members and um, to additionally get students used to um, seeing some of these non-traditional pronouns that are typically associated with those students that really are non-binary and don't really identify as either male or female. Thanks. Could, could either of you talk about how students are coming to us? So are students usually seeking out our assistance on their own? Are they usually coming to us via um, a, a parent or a guardian or are the schools contacting us for help and support these students? How are we connecting with our clients? I will say it's not the schools that are contacting us for support. Um, typically, um, 
typically a referral comes in through a parent or a guardian, um, but our model is representing the student. So we would do an intake with the parent, we would do an intake with the student to identify the student's goals, and we would use the student's goals to really shape what our advocacy looks like. Um, so I don't think we have any one specific referral stream. We have a lot of different partners in the city of Chicago and we get referrals from, from all of them. Um, and again, we also work with uh, youth in the care of DCFS. Um, so it's a pretty diverse stream of, of referrals that we get. Um, but again, um, our clients are typically the student. And so what their goals are um, really kind of determines what our case would look like, how we approach the school, what we're asking for when, when we do that, and, and what remedies we're looking for. Great. And could you talk about um, what types of cases in terms of where a client lives and other financial eligibility guidelines that, that we are looking for that we will accept? So will we only, are we only taking cases um, for students who live in Cook County, or are we accepting cases beyond that? And then what about other financial eligibility? Sorry, I can't see you, Joy. I didn't know. Do you want to answer that or do you want me to? Uh, you can answer it, Nina. Go ahead. Okay, so um, we do have income requirements um, and we do primarily work in Cook County. There are very limited circumstances where we would take a case outside of Cook County, but primarily we're looking at K through 12 school districts uh, in the Cook County area, the biggest one being Chicago Public Schools. Um, all right, and could you talk about other work that we do for LGBTQ plus youth? So specifically issues of housing, um, name and gender marker changes, and if you could talk about how we have engaged pro bono and volunteers in that work. Yeah, so I can take that one. Um, so our uh, LGBTQ anti-violence and safety project um, that was recently created, um, sort of addresses and brings our children and families practice group and the work that we do within the group to the LGBTQ community, um, primarily by working with um, you know, community partners, like Nina said, community partners are a way that we are able to access client um, communities um, and potentially get referrals to the practice group. And so um, this, uh, this project is uh, focused on uh, domestic violence um, and uh, representing um, either uh, LGBTQ parents in domestic relations cases or those parents that have LGBTQ children um, that uh, stand to potentially um, lose parenting time um, and uh, for, the, for, the, for the protection of that um, LGBTQ child, um, we could represent a parent that was in a domestic relations case. Uh, in addition to that, the project um, is also focused on getting LGBTQ clients to our other practice groups. And so I've been doing a lot of work um, along with my, uh, one, some of our paralegal staff of trying to do some just initial pre-screening of clients and connecting them directly to our other practice groups to try to remove some of the barriers for LGBTQ students to get to our services so that they can access the comprehensive civil legal services that we provide as an agency. Um, and so, you know, we've, I've gotten a ton of referrals, um, particularly in areas of uh, employment. Um, we, we, we get a few housing inquiries, um, criminal records, um, and then, uh, you know, in addition to the other areas that I would directly do within the children and families practice group. Um, so, you know, this, this is directly aimed at trying to provide this, these services to the LGBTQ community. In terms of pro bono um, involvement, um, we're again, always seeking more volunteers. I know that um, we've got some uh, projects that are sort of tangentially um, supporting of the, of the LGBTQ community. I know that we're always looking for more volunteers for our criminal records relief. Um, criminal records relief, particularly for uh, trans clients, is a huge area um, that we get a lot of referrals from. And so you could potentially, uh, again, you could help a lot of folks with uh, criminal records relief work, but that is one of the uh, projects that I've often referred to um, for people looking to get more involved. That's a great opportunity. Um, and then, you know, we, we've also had our school uh, to prison um, our, our, our project that disrupts school to prison pipeline. And we've gotten volunteers specifically involved in uh, also like school expulsion cases. Again, um, as Nina and I talked about, um, 
access to education for the LGBTQ community is a huge, huge um, issue and trying to keep students in school and, and not subject to some of the exclusion, um, especially like in, in Sean's situation where LGBTQ students are misunderstood and excluded from school wrongfully. And so this is a great opportunity as well to kind of get involved. So there's a lot of ways that you can get involved with us, moral of the story. So come on, come on down and work with us. A plus job on the plugging pro bono, Joey. That's awesome. Um, all right, we've got a couple of questions that are regarding transgender students and high school sports. So, are we seeing any cases regarding that issue? And and then also, are you aware of any laws in Illinois, particularly involving the rights of transgender students to to play on the sports team of their choosing? I don't think we've seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joey, but I don't think we've seen many cases. And I don't know if that's just because our clients aren't athletically inclined or because um, there is a process that involves um, having your medical information sent to, you know, either the IESA or the IHSA and a, a board of, of physicians taking a look at your application. And I think for anybody who um, was a teenager, um, it's understandable that there are a lot of students who don't want to go through that process. And I think that if you look at what's happening on a national level, when transgender students are attempting to participate in a sport um, and, and play on a team that aligns with their gender identity, you've seen a lot of very public pushback from other athletes or from parents, or in some cases from school administration. So we haven't seen that a lot. Um, we have yet to get a case, um, but I think, you know, as we mentioned, um, it's pretty clear, especially in the state of Illinois, um, that, that schools should not be prohibiting students from participating on sports teams that match their gender identity. Um, so I'm not aware of any, I, I saw somebody asked in the chat, um, federal legislation. Um, there certainly is legislation in the Seventh Circuit around access to bathrooms. I'm not aware of anything regarding access to sports teams, but I know that the uh, Department of Education OCR has made it pretty clear how they view that issue. And so um, it, you know, filing an OCR complaint, um, if, if a student is denied access, I think you would get a favorable decision from OCR if they chose to investigate it. But I'm not aware of any, um, any specific, um, uh, certainly binding cases that address sports in, in Illinois. Yeah, it's not in Illinois. Um, there are, were two trans athlete bands, one in West Virginia, one in Arkansas. That's I think it's still currently getting litigated. Um, but those are those are sort of matriculating through the court systems now. Um, and then I in addition, I know that the ACLU uh, is taking on the issue um, for sports access. Um, so I, they do have one case and I don't know the status of that case. Um, but they are engaging in this litigation um, at the impact level. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen any in my work here at Legal Aid Chicago. I don't think we've had any of those um, pop up in any of our clients' work. All right, great. I've got one more question here before we wrap us up. Um, and this is a, sort of a best practices question. So um, when working with youth, um, especially youth that have, you know, selected different names to use at different times, do you think it's appropriate or how would you best handle, um, you know, confirming what name that youth would prefer to use? Is, is asking at the beginning of each meeting the way to handle it? Is it, you know, what other recommendations might you have? I mean, one thing that I would say is, um, you know, asking the student what their preference is in a private setting is what would be, I think, considered best practice. So if you're in a meeting in front of a bunch of people, not putting that student on the spot and requiring them to make a declaration as to sort of their, you know, what, what their identity is and, and what their preferences are related to being asked about it. Um, always, always, always ask in a private setting one-on-one -on -one when you've built that relationship with a student. Um, and then a good rule of thumb is allowing the student to self-identify um, and before they self-identify, you can use gender neutral pronouns um, and you can conduct, you know, call this. And if the student has adjusted their name, um, uh, you know, 
a good practice is again, confirming that in a private setting, not in front of many people. Um, and that that's usually the best way to do that and to handle that, um, that I would recommend. I don't know, Nina, you have any other suggestions? I, I was just gonna add in, being respectful, I think goes a long way, um, especially when you're asking questions about preferred names or preferred pronouns, um, just treating the student with respect, uh, I, I think is, is really important. Um, and I think often it can help to start a conversation, especially if you don't know what pronouns somebody else uses to introduce yourself and use your own. And that signals to the student that, that uh, you understand um, the importance of pronouns and you understand that, that um, sometimes you might not be able to tell a person's pronouns just by looking at them. Great. Well, that is, that's the perfect note of respect and thoughtfulness to end on. I want to thank everyone for joining us today and particularly to Joey and Nina for really an excellent, engaging and informing presentation. Hope that you all will join us again next week, uh, Wednesday at noon for our next session. Thanks again.